Good evening and welcome to the seventh in our PSP series of anniversary lectures. I'm Wally Fletcher and I'm chairman of our board of directors. At Philadelphia School of Psychoanalysis and our clinic, the Consultation Center, we are celebrating 50 years of providing modern psychoanalytic training and community health services to students, clinicians, and clients of wide diversity. Our series is, is titled Modern Psychoanalysis, Adaptations and Advances to emphasize our ongoing commitment to, to the ongoing evolution and advancement of psychoanalysis as a profession and as a provider of therapies of depth, in, insight, relationship and inclusion for people of all sorts and conditions. This evening, it's our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ellen Wright to, pre to present to us on use of the self and care of the self, new directions for working with countertransference. In one of his short essays on psychoanalysis, Donald Winnicott wrote, in doing psychoanalysis, I aim at keeping alive, keeping well, keeping awake. I aim at being myself and behaving myself. Having begun an analysis, I expect to continue with it, to survive it, and to end it. This is sage advice, but how does one do this day after day? And what is the emotional labor involved, especially in dealing with certain types of clients who are capable of inducing self-destructive affects and impulses in the analyst countertransference? Dr. Wright has much experience and wisdom to share with us in this area. She's a licensed psychologist in private practice in Center City, Philadelphia. She works with adults and young adults facing emotional, interpersonal, career, and medical challenges. Her years of experience as an individual and groups, group therapist, teacher, and supervisor are evident in her unique and practical approach to psychotherapy. Dr. Wright is also recognized for her, for her innovative application of psychological theories to areas often considered outside traditional mental health concerns, musical performance, for example, medical illness, business consulting, and education. She believes that psychology, psychology and theories of human emotion and behavior have, very posit have a very positive role and helping people reach their professional and personal goals. Dr. Wright received her undergraduate degree from Princeton University and received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Temple University. She completed her internship at, at Thomas Jefferson University Medical School and also served as a research associate and lecturer there. Her, her, her postdoctoral education continued with training and cert certification in modern analysis and group therapy studying with the renowned Louis Ormond. She's a founding member of the Center for Group Studies in New York City, where she is a supervisor and sought after presenter. As head of the mental health team at the world-renowned Curtis Institute of Music, Dr. Wright provides treatment for the emotional and performance issues of this gifted and diverse student population. In addition to her private practice, she's a co-founder and director of the Clinical Practice Enrichment Series, which offers continuing education workshops for mental health professionals in Philadelphia, New York, and the Pacific Northwest. Best of all, she is a senior supervisor and training analyst at Philadelphia School of Psychoanalysis and is an esteemed member of our psychoanalytic society. She is one of our own, and we're so delighted to have her as our anniversary lecturer tonight. Welcome, Ellen. What a lovely introduction. Thank you so much, Wally. Good afternoon, West Coast colleagues and friends. Good evening, East Coast colleagues and friends. Thank you so much, Wally and Lisa, for inviting me to give this talk at a really very memorable and meaningful anniversary for me, having been in um, one of the earlier classes. Shall we leave it at that? many, many precious years ago. When I started preparing this talk, I imagined providing you with something as simple as three bullet points. How to survive the throes of painful negative transference. 
I thought if I could lay it out in an intellectually accessible way, I'd feel confident, competent, and you'd walk away thinking, I can be impervious to these terribly painful feelings. Or Ellen's really smart. I wish I could be on top of things as she is. I'd leave, my professional re reputation would remain intact, and we'd all bypass what are some of the most painful experiences in our work. Encountering those individuals and group members whose psychic radar homes in on our most painful insecurities. In my fantasies, you'd never know that I can be an incompetent, even stupid, insensitive, and neglectful analyst. Labels that are a combination of my patient's transferences and my own vulnerabilities. When we're asked to explain why we do this difficult work of working in the transference, if we're honest, we might admit we've entered this field for personal reasons, to right the wrongs of our childhood or to do what Lou Ormond called reparative countertransference, we, where we want to not only replay our own past, but attempt to repair the damage done. As therapists, we hope to enact different roles in our personal dramas and help others have better life experiences, to have agency instead of helplessness, to not be limited in our ambitions as parents or siblings were, to be invincible to more trauma. Entering analytic training, my goal, though I didn't consciously know it, was to find a positive home for what Lou Ormond called my sea of emotional responsiveness. Even with all my work, I still respond to these words rather than the other objectives he used, which seemed much more presentable, my drive and my discipline. Truth be told, I wanted to find a place for my desire for connection where it would be valued and understood. I found just this during my training at PSP and in the years of consultation that followed. In honor of PSP's 50th anniversary, I'd like to offer for your consideration a theoretical and emotional scaffolding for working with negative transference when all our clinical training and our emotional experience fail us. During the next 45 minutes, I'd like to share with you my idea that a therapist's sense of self and resilience is sustained by accessing what I call a valuing self. Joining what Larry Epstein called the therapist's observing self and experiencing self, the valuing self is what counterbalances the toxicity of the negative projections by supplying the emotional nourishment we need to do this difficult work. I'll present two vignettes which demonstrate how I accessed and used the valuing self in challenging and painful clinical circumstances. We'll then divide into breakout groups for 25 minutes to allow you to discuss similar experiences and how you coped with them. Hyman Spotnitz, the founder of Modern Analysis, brought to psychoanalysis the idea of the narcissistic defense that aggression that's not welcomed in early relationships is often turned against the self, creating a host of unpleasant effects, depression, self-criticism, forgetfulness, sleepiness, even psychosis. In our work with patients, this same type of self-attack can be activated in, in us when we're recipients of negative transference. The negativity of these critical transferences when turned in on ourselves can rob us of the psychic energy necessary to be therapeutic agents for our patients. So for us to be effective therapists, we need to manage the destructive effects of self-attack for both us and our patients. Modern analysts believe that by helping the patient reverse the narcissistic defense, directing the anger outward instead of directing the anger inward, we enable our patients to convert what would have been self-destructive energy into life-promoting energy. To facilitate this process, we need to be receptive, even psychically personify the patient's hated parts of themselves and their early caregivers. 
while we know intellectually that this is a necessary part of the therapeutic process, it can be acutely painful, even personal, when it hits our vulnerable parts. When their bad objects line up with our bad self objects, self criticisms bloom and stop us from thinking, moreover, feeling our way through these fraught therapeutic encounters. To be effective therapists, we have to engage in a parallel process where we convert our self-destructive attacks into constructive problem solving. Lawrence Epstein was a masterful participant and observer in the process of working with negative transference and countertransference. Today's talk is based on his work, The Analyst, Bad Analyst Feelings the counterpart to the process of resolving implosive impulses. His bad analyst feeling occurs when a patient projects the pathological aspects of their primary caregivers and of themselves into you, their therapist. Few of us in this audience have escaped this process. And as I think, as I speak, the experiences may jumping, be jumping to your minds Please remember those scenarios because you'll have time to discuss them with one another in the breakout rooms. Epstein offers us intellectual and emotional lifeline by suggesting that we bring to the therapeutic process, not only our ability to observe our inner, inner process, but also to experience our process. Tonight, I'd like to add and emphasize that we also need to develop and access a valuing self. This valuing self turns our critical attention to the positive attributes of ourselves that make us effective, caring therapists. This valuing self is what can enable us to survive the tumultuous sea of negative feelings. By accessing valued attributes of ourselves as therapists and as people, we can become protected by what Lugol Ormond called an insulation barrier. This enables us to remain available and effective when we're seen as bad analysts. The ability to value oneself and to access the positive qualities you have in the eyes of others provides a psychic nourishment that helps us set aside these toxic ideas long enough to examine what's happening in these challenging interactions. I say set aside rather than replace because it's in the examination of the themes of one's self-attack that one can locate essential information about the patient's life history. A friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Aaron Black said to me, once we stop the self-attack, we need somewhere to land. It's in this self-valuing place that we can land and examine the psychic landscape of the treatment. Able to be curious about our reactions rather than punish ourselves for them, we're emboldened to sort subjective from objective countertransference and use what we learn to guide the therapy. Without the support of the valuing self, negative projections can ring true and can overwhelm or disable our competent therapeutic selves. With the support of our valuing self, we can understand this intermixing of negative projections and subjective experience use this essential information to address old traumas. So how do we build and access this value in self? We need to create alternative valuing voices. When asked how he tolerated negative transference, Lou Ormont would say, at least my mother loved me. If these words don't happen to be available to you, how do you build and then preserve this positive sense of self? One of the gifts of group therapy is the opportunity to hear how others experience, experience you differently from how you see yourself. This novel and often enlightening dynamic is also present in our relationships with our therapists and our colleagues. Many of you are here today. The voices of our mentors, Analysts, training groups, and supervisors provide us with a sense of our value to our professions, to our patients, and to one another. When our inner voice and the voice of our patients are critical, these alternate voices can offer us emotional refuge. 
Another essential component of evaluating self relies on the modern analytic tenet that psychological health consists of the ability to tolerate, moreover, accept all of our feelings, both positive and negative. Our patient's negative transference can wound and disable when we want to deny or disown attributes that we don't like about ourselves. Many of us hope to rise above our human frailties as a compensation for our painful history. This drive towards perfection presents itself in our supervisory sessions and training groups as an intense internal pressure to be perfect, moreover, invulnerable. Ironically, when we disown these negative aspects of ourselves and our feelings, they often manifest in the patients that walk into our consulting rooms. The emotional medicine for this noble but unrealistic drive to avoid imperfection and vulnerability is in our analyses and training groups. Here we find the permission to be all of ourselves. This invitation to be, to tolerate, be curious, and step back from our prohibitions provides us with the strength needed to hear our limitations verbalized by our individual patients and our groups. A third source of positive self-regard is knowing that we're not alone in our imperfection. Too often we believe that we're the ones that have not figured out how to respond properly, or we have some personal defect that others don't have that lead us to make mistakes or misjudge what's going on in our work with patients. This belief in our singular imperfection can lead us to isolate, disguise or hide evidence of our insecurities and our limitations. It prevents us from revealing our challenges to our supervisors, training groups and consultants, even friends, because it's too shameful. Keeping our feelings to ourselves, we are then deprived of the bomb we get by taking the risk to tell trusted others, people who would reward our, our courage with acceptance, joining, even enjoyment, of our confessions, exactly what can melt the isolating shame. To summarize, working as therapist means we'll experience all the emotions and sensations available to human beings, many of which are deeply disturbing and difficult. Develop developing the valuing self enables us to use these painful feelings and the stories they tell more effectively in our work. Calling upon our alternate valuing voices accepting all our feelings and knowing we're not alone in them are essential components of a sturdy and resilient valuing self that makes our work possible and sustaining. It's my hope that in listening to my clinical travails tonight, you'll consider taking me as your companion and as you listen, invite your valuing self to appear. Modern analytic theory of treatment posits that the development of the narcissistic transference we're, we're seeing similar to our patients is critical to the treatment. In this process, we allow our patients to project upon us the very attributes that they hate about themselves. If we comfortably inhabit these projected hated parts, patients learn to accept those parts in themselves as they watch us accept those parts in ourselves. This process can be fraught for us, however, if we struggle with similar prohibitions and self-condemnation and can't tolerate the negative transference that they verbalize to us. When faced with criticism of our work, even our person, who doesn't want to restore your ego to a better position? Our methods for defending against these disowned parts can at times appear like useful therapeutic approaches. We protect ourselves by discrediting the patient's projections with our view of the truth, or avoid being painted with the transferential brush by diverting the attacker's attention to their history, implying it's their issue, not our own. When accused of being unhelpful, who doesn't struggle with the urge to remind the patient of their progress and our role in improving their lives? 
At the core of all these measures is our wish to protect ourselves, our sense of our value to our patient, and at times our value to ourselves. These counter ther therapeutic protective measures can be avoided when one accesses your valuing self. Accessing your valuing self strengthens your wounded ego by injecting it with the restorative presence of someone who respects and values you at the very time that these attributes are unacknowledged by your patients. I'd like to read you an excerpt from my chapter titled Redefining Female Power, The Myth of the Selfless Therapist, recently published in a book titled Women, Intersectionality and Power in Group Psychotherapy Leadership. I've chosen to present vignettes from my group practice tonight because in group, this more public exposure makes one's vulnerabilities being aired and critiqued much more challenging and tolerating the transferences and the resulting transferences even more difficult. In this excerpt, you'll see how I embodied in my intervention, healthy self-interest, a new and emerging ability for me, but a taboo behavior for a group member for whom guilt prevented her from living a full life. Some of the most tension-filled and intimate moments of my life as a group therapist have been those moments when I brought my emotions, my vulnerability into the group. In this scenario, rather than putting the interests of the group ahead of my own, I disregarded the traditional female prohibition against showing self-interest and stepped into a transference projection charged with gender expectations. In doing so, I hope to create the opportunity to resolve taboos against self-interest for group members. During a particularly severe winter, my naive and, dare I say, omnipotent belief that you could beat mother nature was challenged when group members somehow were hindered from attending my group. One measure, one member who I'll call Judy, was vocal about her inability to attend group and the financial consequences of being charged for the missed sessions. Other group members, while apologetic about their absences, were silent about the fee issue. The evening before the group, I noticed myself checking the weather and obsessing about whether the snow would again be an obstacle to group attendance. I felt apprehensive about who would come and how it would affect the group process. Judy's anger at me was clearly at play. I began to question my decision to charge for these sessions. Having been trained by a male group therapist who never canceled group and enforced the policy of payment for absences regardless of circumstance, I didn't consider that a female acting in a similar ma manner might not receive the same reception as a male leader. Aware of Judy's growing anger, I began to ruminate attack myself even about whether I was being too rigid about payment for missed groups. I wondered whether I should placate her and waive the fee or continue to work directly with her anger in the group. My choice to assert my interests over those of the group directly contradicted Judy's behavior and her family where she compulsively put her needs last. Allowing her family drama to surface in the group was essential to working through a dynamic that was destructive to her ability to live her life fully and unhampered by crushing guilt for having healthy self-interest. The night before the group and the next snowstorm, I still remember it, I con consulted a trusted colleague, the same one who helped me see myself as a valued, accomplished therapist and to ask for fees commensurate with my talents and experience. Speaking my inner conflict out loud, her voice reminded me to access my valuing self. Psychically residing on this island of acceptance and validation gave me the courage to do the obvious but emotionally challenging option, to step further into the enactment and to consult the group about what I should do. Armed with the plan to discuss the dilemma the next day, I woke up to a, what I thought was a modest amount of snowfall. An hour before the group, I received a frantic phone call from Judy. I was in an accident trying to get to your group. 
I'm leaving out the expletive. She exclaimed, I got into I got into my car thinking I could get there this week. I was thinking I'd better get there because I'd get charged anyway. Alarm and guilt sprang to the forefront of my mind. The unpredictability of life events reopened the door for my critical voice. Pathologizing my emerging valued sense of self, this voice shouted, you're greedy, your self-interest was destructive. Why couldn't you just let it go? I was propelled into action to quiet this voice and reclaim my good analyst position. I reassured Judy that she shouldn't worry about the money and mentioned that given how severe the winter was, I was considering giving everybody a snow credit. After I got off the phone, I was aware that I'd acted on my discomfort mentioning a snow credit before she returned to discuss it in group. I was clearly unnerved by the events and wanted to escape the transference of an uncaring, greedy group therapist whose self-interest led to harm. When I met with the group, I informed them of Judy's accident and mentioned my thoughts about a snow credit. While the members were concerned about Judy and appreciative of the credit, the issue of the money seemed to not be as significant a topic as I expected. Later that day, I contacted Judy to see how she was feeling. She said she was fine and reiterated her anger about my lack of empathy with group members like herself. Clearly my acting out, having an out of group discussion with her did not inhibit Judy from expressing her anger with me. It had the opposite effect. She came into the group with an additional reason to be angry with me. At the next group, Judy expressed her anger at me for not adhering to her gender expectations, self-sacrifice that ruled her life. Holding my tongue, I endured her continued vitriol and explored whether others felt as she did. After the other members spoke, Judy turned to me and pointed at, pointedly asked me what I thought. I felt her opposition. Her aggressive challenge made me unsure about how to preserve my new emerging self-interest. I was uncertain about whether to continue to work within the transference enactment or move towards a reparative intervention using self-disclosure. I proceeded trusting that I had the resilience to recover from the aggression that might occur in response. I thought and I felt that it was important to disclose my internal process with affect. I emphasize with affect because too often as intelligent, thoughtful group leaders, we offer explanations without the intense feelings that go with them. This can serve the purpose of explaining, excusing, even rationalizing a way of behavior for which we're under attack. It can also communicate that the therapist is uncomfortable with the feelings in the group. This approach undermines the emotional current essential to the group process, because in removing the affect, we're removing ourselves from connection with the group. I said to the group, I've been struggling with my desire to believe that the group could meet under any circumstances because I wanted to provide a consistent container for our work. I was not able to accept that I could not control the weather and I had difficulty accepting the financial consequences of our not meeting. I regret that I didn't resolve this struggle sooner and address this earlier. The tone of my words, my facial expression, and the purposeful use of self-disclosure had a reparative effect. My comments demonstrated a willing to admit that I had made decisions that may not have benefited the group. Revealing my dilemma required the courage to discuss my grandiosity and self-interest. As a woman, I felt particularly vulnerable to criticism for being interested in my income. The purpose of my modeling self-reflection and disclosure was twofold to acknowledge my part in Judy's perception that I did have self-interest in this process and to model that a respected person could publicly admit her limitations, potentially opening herself up to further criticism. Speaking so openly about my missteps in the group and being transparent about my concern for my income surprised and touched many members. During that group and in subsequent groups, members talked about their appreciation that I could be so honest and genuine. 
Moreover, group members struggling with related feelings of having to be perfect expressed relief that I could so openly discuss the reasons for my missteps and my feelings about its impact. What struck me most about this exchange was the incredible intimacy I felt with the group. The decision to describe what was going on with me felt risky, not unlike the risk that members take to be vulnerable in my group. Despite my concern, when I took that risk, my disclosure was met with a deepening connection. It's at times like these that I'm reminded of the potential for intimacy that group offers. Looking at this scenario with the lens of implicit bias, I wish I could have spoken to the oppressive impact of asserting my power as a group leader. While championing my right to have my time respected and compensated, I was not able to admit myself that the tenacity of my initial attachment to being compensated spoke of my own need to re revise, rise above my lesser status as a female of my generation by incorporating the privileged behavior of my white male group mentor. Had I been more aware of my anger at having been devalued because I was a female and how this fueled my attachment to my power as a group leader, I might have been able to recognize and speak more to how Judy's identity as a working class member of a family that had limited resources and as a woman who identified as gay fueled our enactment. Speaking to my privilege and power as a white professional group leader would have provided group members with a reparative experience of a group leader addressing societal power dynamics. Part of the process of caring for ourselves and our patients is recognizing when we're in the throes of challenging transference, counter-transference dynamics and pausing to access and reconnect to our professional selves. While this description makes it sound so easy, sometimes I don't re recognize that I'm on this emotional speeding train until my body or my spirit start to protest. Lou Ormond's description of transference provides a helpful anchor when intense emotions swirl between us and the patient and within us. He reminds us that we can recognize transference and countertransference by its insistence pervasiveness and excessiveness. I would add urgency. When I'm in the midst of resisting a negative transference, I'm alerted to it by an increase in what I would call my therapeutic zeal. This intense drive moves me into my intellect and is in, is in response to what can sometimes feel like a quiet panic. Fueled by this discomfort, I can observe my mind sometimes freezing or doing the opposite being filled with an intellectual and emotional search for insights and interventions, while often leading to new, new understandings, the search can also distract me from the emotional toll that this process is taking on me. You may recognize yourself in this description or may respond to the loss of professional equilibrium differently. This rush to overcome uncomfortable emotions, to return to the good analyst feeling, can curtail our analytic curiosity and arises from our own character and history. In the next vignette, my struggle with the bad analyst feeling appeared on the surface to be related to my loss of a sense of professional competency or control. Slowly, I realized it was related to something more personal. The nourishing aspect of our work that we rarely speak of the pleasure of feeling attuned with our patients. We can readily admit how important emotional attachment is for our patients, but how many of us can only admit in the privacy of our own minds, how precious, how sustaining this feeling of connection can be for us, the therapist. When this connection is disrupted by a stalemate in treatment or an enactment of a dynamic pressing for repair, we feel its absence and we can go into action to regain it. Instead of recognizing and allowing the misattunement to develop into its needed therapeutic form, we often struggle against it. Werber in his article titled Deadlock and Psychotherapy, a phenomenological study of eight psychodynamic therapist experiences 
describes this feeling well when he said that ther therapists experience unfulfilled expectations of closeness and connection, the attunement that we didn't get in our early life, as well as unwelcome feelings and wishes, which can evoke self-doubt and questioning of their professional role. Relief from this version of the bad analyst feeling can come from reconnecting with the value in self in the form of the words of our internalized colleagues. Returning to colleagues' affirming voices provides us with firm ground when we feel unmoored and even lost. The pandemic and now the war in Ukraine are testing our ability to cope with isolation and loss. In pre-pandemic times, we can all imagine even fear the loss of beloved patients. Sometimes we even tell ourselves that it's our inadequacies, our notable lack of analytic skill that causes our patients to depart. In the next vignette, I describe how my difficulty acknowledging my own grief prevented me from tolerating the separation and loss caused by COVID and how it impacted my work with a long-term training group. One of the primary purposes of the therapeutic frame is to notify us of our patients and our own resistances and invite their investigation. In the case that follows, I'll discuss my decision to change the frame of this long-term training group by shortening days long intensives to three hour sessions and meeting more frequently than the usual three times a year. These changes in the frame should have alerted me to the presence of, of my resistance, my inability to tolerate and address the effect of my personal grief on how I worked with the group during the pandemic. If I can state the obvious, COVID made conducting group therapy very challenging. Having suffered the loss of a close family member prior to the pandemic, I was actively fighting to keep my grief from interfering in my work. Like many of you, I was working so hard to adjust to the demands of online training. I was unprepared for the profound effect the loss of in-person meetings would have on me, specifically its activation of fear of further loss. The wish to avoid more loss was enacted in my willingness, dare I say eagerness, to shift the frame of my meetings with my longest standing training group, one that I had met with for over 20 years. On the surface, my shifting the frame seemed clinically prudent, but as the pandemic continued, the number of changes I made in response to my group members' difficulties mounted. I began to experience what I called frame fatigue. Along with this fatigue was the nagging feeling that my emotions rather than my clinical acumen were driving my actions with this group. I became aware that I was acting rather than talking about the emotional and physical challenges of my group members. I was chasing the unattainable, the ability to avoid old and new feelings of deprivation, to find relationships in a world deprived of emotional connection and physical contact. My original rationale for the changes in the frame was therapeutic, to be responsive and to protect the energies of my therapist trainees, any of whom were working online all week. Underneath the challenges of a weekend training, I sensed even felt their transference fears, that their difficulties would fall on deaf ears as they had in childhood and that they were not important enough to me or their group siblings to warrant accommodations. And they, as a result, would suffer abandonment. During the next two years, I worked to respond to psychic traumas that emerged as we were thrust into virtual contact. I tried to keep the group intact and not privilege group members tolerant of virtual connection over those whose difficulties were exacerbated by a lack of a physical group connection. I felt very much like a mother who wanted to keep all her children with her, albeit virtually, with the added sadness that I was 3,000 miles away. Underneath my action was what Leslie Rosenthal would identify as one of the most powerful countertransference fears, the wish not to be seen as an unresponsive, uncaring, or neglected group mother. 
By focusing on the group's needs, I was able to distance myself from my own feelings of isolation, loneliness, and loss. I had a purpose, a duty to perform. One that, if successful, would make me feel some agency in a very out of control world. My refusal to step into the toxic identity of the unavailable distancing mother fueled my drive to keep my unhappy family together. Underneath these efforts was my inability to admit that I was not just an altruistic therapist devoted to keeping her group together, but someone who needed the connection, the reassurance that my group valued me and needed me. Psychoanalytic theory reminds us to help our patients put their thoughts and feelings into words, not into action. In changing the frame, I banished through action the feelings and fears I didn't want to acknowledge, that I could lose group members as I had lost others. I struggled against feelings of powerlessness by redoubling my efforts to be a healing presence for my grieving self and the group, hoping that this would be a salve for the senselessness of my and the world's losses. Rather than help the group talk about their anger and experience of loss, I unconsciously stimulated reactions in the group that compounded these feelings. I noticed feeling irritated with members who took care of themselves by changing their attendance at group. I felt frustration rather than curiosity about the group's members' actions. In redoubling my attentiveness to their needs rather than exploring all of my group members' feelings, I sowed the seeds of my own resentment as group members didn't comply with my wishes and intricate plans. I now recognize my efforts as self-protective, distractions from my feelings that prevented me from therapeutically addressing the feelings of loss that were already in the group. Looking back, not only did I not want to feel the loss of several original members of my long-term group, but I also didn't want to feel the bad landless feeling. I listened to, but could not emotionally welcome my group members' frustration at the deprivation of virtual group particularly the protests of one group member who had been nourished and cherished by the group for many years. For this group member, being in a virtual group whose leader didn't welcome her distress replicated the deprivation of her childhood. The virtual connection wiped out her memory of being held in physical time and space and plunged her back into her family home all alone. The group felt like a rejection that ultimately led to her painful regression. It was a poor substitute for the heartfelt group she had experienced. This group member, I'll call her Lee, finally enacted her anger at me and sent an email saying she was not going to attend the next group and she was leaving. Still under the sway of my impulse to prevent the pain of loss, I asked her for a phone session during which I continued to use my keen hour analytic powers of persuasion to no avail, she refused to return. During the week before the next group, I was finally able to study the intensity of my feelings and the resulting actions. I actually had to picture losing the group members in order to start to come to terms with their potential departure. Remembering my discussions with other respected colleagues about their challenges in sustaining their groups during the pandemic, I felt my judgment for my difficulties lessen. In these supported conversations, I also found a safe place to recognize and experience my continued feelings of grief. In allowing myself to feel these feelings, I realized that despite my best efforts, I would have to feel the pain of the group's anger and the loss of some of my longtime group members, people who had been part of my life as I had been part of theirs for so many years. The psychic company of my colleagues helped my fearful self coexist with my mature self. Hearing that they too failed to keep group members and struggled with the impingement of the pandemic on their ability to provide an environment for healing, I was able to replace my sense of singular imperfection with the intimacy of connection that comes from shared trauma. Their psychic company helped me tolerate the upcoming loss 
and to decide how to bring these issues into the therapeutic process. Supported in my grief by my colleagues' understanding and care, I was able to stop my self-attack and get relief from the stress of trying to do the impossible, to preserve relationships that the pandemic was inevitably changing. I had to face the reality that my omnipotent group therapist ideal would not protect me. In my, my desire to prevent my own loss, I had used the cloak of the devoted group therapist, one ever responsive, to disguise and to hide my own fear of losing this precious connection to my group and as a defense against feeling the bad analyst feelings. This resistance led me to block indeed, if not in word, the expression of anger at me in the group, as well as the expression of loss with each other. Buoyed by my connection with my valuing self, I was able to bring into the group the topic of loss and how they, moreover I, were trying to escape its grip. My acknowledgement that we all had losses to mourn brought this painful reality into the group. The process of accepting responsibility for the consequences of my actions didn't end with the group session, however. Soon after the group meeting, Lee contacted me asking for an individual session. I was surprised that she contacted me. In my child self mind, our relationship was lost when she left the group. In this state of mind, I couldn't imagine all the ways in which our relationship had created a powerful, loving presence inside Lee, one that persevered even beyond her membership in group. In this individual session, Lee described her reluctance to talk with me and explained the meaning of her silence in group. She expressed her anger at my refusal to let her leave the group. She said that the online group revoked the trauma of her childhood being alone in her room, feeling totally separate from a group family with a group leader mother who was only interested in herself. She continued to speak what she saw was my selfishness, that my request that she remain in the group was putting my needs above her own as her mother did. This compelled her to regress to her childhood form of protest and punishment, silence. I felt very emotional listening to Lee's words. It pained me to know the harmful effects of our enactment. Curious and relieved by hearing her feelings, I sensed an underlying lightness, even freedom in her words. In putting words to her feelings, this group member was proclaiming her newly found sense of entitlement and independence, fruits of her years of hard work in group. I knew that when I responded, I needed to step into this co-created enactment with a reparative intervention and accept responsibility for my self-interested acts and have the bad analyst feeling. I spoke with the emotion I felt about my regret that I had not been able to let her leave. I said I wasn't able to tolerate the loss of our connection forged over our years together. She laughed and said, she didn't worry about the loss of our relationship, why did I? For her, this departure from group was the result of a healing process of individuation, one born of a relationship with me and her group siblings that included conflict and then repair. Smiling inwardly, I felt grateful for the ways in which my work continued to heal me and for how modern analysis continued to enrich my life. Sharing these cases with all you valuing colleagues my valuing self has grown. These cases involve painful feelings that resulted in emotional journeys for my patients and for me. In the first vignette, instead of being left with my foolish omnipotence and a feeling of inadequacy, calling upon my affirming colleagues allowed me to demonstrate that valuing of myself could share space with humility and empathy for others. In the second vignette, instead of being shamed for abandoning the sturdy frame for one that offered the false hope of avoiding loss, I left the isolation of my grief to join my community of colleagues whose sharing of my grief gave me the strength to call forth my valuing self. My valuing self enabled me to admit my misguided actions and discuss the reason for them, 
And in doing so, my group and I, and then Lee, forged a deeper connection that healed old wounds. Valuable lessons that in sharing them with you, again, calls forth my valuing self. Thank you. I'd like to take the time now to break into smaller groups. And I'd like you to talk about two questions that are already probably on your mind. What experiences you've had with negative transference? And when have you experienced the bad analyst feelings? And how did you cope? Or like me at times, fail to cope with them. And then after about 25 minutes, we'll reconvene and talk together about whatever you'd like to discuss. Let's give everybody a couple minutes to, um, actually, I don't want to donate more than a minute more. Um, you were very attentive listeners. So I'd like to hear um, any questions that you sent uh, Jim or anything that you'd like to talk about. You just have to um, unmute yourself. I don't see any questions in the queue. Uh, so there's there's comments and observations uh, expressing thanks uh, for the for the the uh, lecture that you presented, but there aren't any specific questions. So, so that means you all uh, were either fleeing from my stories, or quietly getting nourishment from other things besides your valuing selves. Uh, but there is something about speaking things aloud, which I think changes how you feel about them. So uh, I'd invite you to, um, to talk about it. Let's see. There is one here. One thing we discussed in our group was when the client's goal different from that of the therapist. And does someone who uh, was part of that conversation want to say more about that? Judith Snyder. Uh, yeah, we had a nice group, everybody with lots of different backgrounds and degrees of experience, but with the common experience that sometimes our goals, what we thought might be best for the patient or best direction, is not the same as that of the uh, client or the client's parents.
Well, I just well, that's a very interesting um, uh, point, Judy, because often we will get used with, uh, which is you will start to have the feelings that um, people, I hope I'm not unstable. I'm not internally unstable, but my internet might be unstable. Uh, you can get induced with what the parents of your patient or their various interjects want from them. And it's very important to study for the client because that is material maybe from your past, but certainly from them. And and uh, you, you want to notice what you do with those feelings, whether it makes you start directive or more critical. Or, and uh, so I, I would consider that not only a conscious thing, which is you're investigating why your goals for the client should supersede their goals for themselves, or whether there are outside influences that are impacting the treatment and haven't been brought into the room. There's a uh, Simon Bressler that has his hand up. Simon, if, if you have a question. Yeah, um, well, I really appreciated that talk, Ellen. Um, and I, I liked how you, you just said, you know, the pleasure of feeling attuned to our patients. I, I haven't heard that said quite in that way and it feels so true to me. Um, so I, I really like that. And it made me think about your, the second vignette where you did not want to be seen as an unresponsive, not caring group mother with Lee. And I was thinking, or I guess I was just wondering what you would have done differently or what you might have said um, using the sort of authenticity that you were speaking to in the first vignette to um, move towards repair or a deeper kind of progressive emotional moment. Oh no, did Ellen freeze? <clears throat> yeah, and, well, I know mine's um, freezing. Uh, Simon, I would have brought the other cut out. Uh, we lost you, Ellen. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Now you're oh, back. Am I back? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, someone just, uh, maybe Jim, you can tell me by raising. It looks like we might have lost her again. Yeah, I think your screen's freezing, Alan. I think your screen's freezing. Yeah, the audio is coming and going now. Yeah. I'm coming and going. Yeah, the audio. The audio. Okay. There you are. And how are we doing this to you? <laughs> <laughs> this might be a crazy idea, Alan, and I don't know if you want to try it or not, but sometimes I found when this happens, if you turn off your video, that the audio doesn't, um, I don't know. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see if that's better. Um, I think I would have had to bite the bullet and really consider, as I said, visualize people not coming to the group or asking, uh, noticing and speaking to more the, uh, there weren't that many people who came and went, but wondering perhaps in about the absence of negative comments, whether I was doing something to block them. I would have explored earlier what would happen if I didn't change the frequency, uh, you know, the, the frequency of the groups or the length of the groups. Now this group was particularly difficult because there were several people who had medical conditions in there and they couldn't tolerate being online at, for as long as the group normally met. So there was also uh, a um, delay in addressing how uncomfortable the able-bodied group members felt and how um, selfish they felt that they could come to the group and sit. And there was very little talk of the guilt that people felt about the one member who, who really was so ill that she could only last for three hours. So there was a, a quality of my wanting to hold on to her um, and the groups wanting to hold on to her. It, it was really a very mixed experience because some people who had 
um, suffered from medical illnesses, felt very appreciative that the group frame adjusted, that their experience was that life did not adjust for them, that they were, they were outcasts or seen as somehow uh, less disciplined or less uh, motivated to do life the regular way. It's the type of ableism that we experience. So uh, there was something very reparative for uh, certain, certain uh, patients in that group because I adjusted it. But at a, at a certain point, um, I could have spoken much more directly to what, what would have happened if I didn't adjust it? How would people feel towards me? Um, uh, what if they, I had that when I went back to going in person, though the pandemic uh, shortened that. To, uh, to have people really talk about the loss directly. Thank you. Welcome. There's another question. Uh, the uh, Amy Albert would like to hear you talk about dealing with fight or flight feelings that result from an attacking patient. How do I deal with them? Uh, first of all, I notice them in my body. I don't know whether it's life experiences or just a greater attention to our physical selves, but I will notice um, when my physical temperature rises and I've learned to observe that and, and uh, actually meditating really helps with this. Those of you who find that useful, observe it, have a momentary panic, and then just uh, try to calm myself and study what's, what's the nature of my flight. What am I running from? Uh, what, is, what is being spoken that I have to step into? Uh, modern analysts have been known to speak uh, sort of boldly the, the unspoken, which, you know, when we talk about, you're gonna have to pay, pay, pay a fee. Well, how, why do you want me to pay a fee? It says, well, what's wrong? with liking money, who doesn't wanna have money? So there's a way which um, when I'm moving away, I have to ask myself, what is it that my body doesn't want me to engage in and to say? And then, uh, and then really remind myself that part of the, the work is you're verbalizing things that are at the forefront of the client, but their, their uh, defenses prevent them from saying it. And there really is a situation of, of your, uh, who's gonna show yours first. It's actually, we have to go first. <laughs> and that's where um, having a sense of internalized colleagues who don't think you're outrageous, who know that you like to have a healthy income, but you're not um, wanting to bleed people dry, who know that, that even if sometimes you miss things, you're very empathic, it, it can balance that uh, uh, sense of badness that you have to temporarily inhabit. I mean, a patient today called me inept and she really enjoyed it. And earlier when I was running this group uh, during the week, I thought, I hope this group doesn't fall apart because it'd be really difficult for me to have any sense of integrity to come in and talk to you about how I dealt with negative transfers. This woman went on to tell me how inept she was. And suddenly her mother didn't seem so inept because I was more inept than her mother, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so she experienced the, the, the level of intervention I was doing um, with another group member is insufficient. She couldn't tell me how to, uh, how to help her. So instead of um, asking for something that she couldn't even imagine, a mother who would be able to think of how to help her. I told her, could she tell me things that, that um, I was doing that she didn't like? Often people can tell you more often what doesn't sit well with them than what they want because expressing what they want to a transference uh, object that is not interested in them just is, is futile in many people's minds. So that's a very, very slow um, process to develop. It's certainly in individual therapy, Group therapy helps more because there are some very bold people who don't have any problem asking for what they want as often as they are given the opportunity to. Thank you. There was, there was an indication that uh, uh, 
uh, I think it's Judith raised her hand and then just that quickly uh, uh, the message flashed off the screen. So if you could speak to uh, the question that you had. Maybe she froze up too. Or somebody whose name isn't Judith can grab the time, you know. I, 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 I don't know if I have a question, but I have something. Okay. Brian? So yeah, hi Alan, uh, nice to good see to see you. you. Nice to see you. Um, the, the, the feeling that I, my go-to difficult feeling is generally incompetence, being made to feel or feeling incompetence in the group. I'm thinking about this particular group and it usually happens when somebody is uh, being destructive to the group in a way, you know, I mean, verbally attacking the group, doesn't get what they want from the group, they're not being straightforward, the group lets them down because the group is confused and then they attack the group. And I guess I have this fear, like they're going to destroy the group. It's never happened yet, uh, but that, that, that creates the feeling of, of incompetence. Like I gotta do something. How am I gonna, what, I'm, what am I gonna do that I'm gonna you know, protect this group or it won't fall apart or people won't be driven away by this, this particular person's behavior. So I don't know if I have a question, um, I, and but I, I think I'm responding to you know group members' fear. Uh, so it's just uh, just a comment about uh, the feeling of incompetence in the face of uh, feeling incompetent, <laughs> incompetence and feeling of not knowing what to do and worried that the group is going to fall apart, you know, be driven be driven apart in a sense. When, when, when I have that fantasy, I often wonder whether the, the, the fight of, between the members is coming from very, very basic primitive needs. And I'll say, does anybody else feel like this is a, a matter of life and death that's being yeah. discussed here? It, sometimes when, when you use um, charged words like hate and murder and stuff like that, it, it doesn't ring true. But when you're feeling like uh, that, that someone's going to live and someone's going to die, I'll say that. Yeah. Ah. And, uh, I'm, you know, and I'll wonder why I might be having that feeling. So even if I can just say that, then uh -huh. uh, speaking to that sometimes releases some anxiety in me. And there's certainly probably some people in the, in the, in the group who's, who have watched people be sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, that that at least takes some of uh, brings some of the fear or the the hidden danger into the room. Right. It, it, it could also it could also serve to get them at least to step back and have some observing ego. Yeah. But Ellen, I, I also feel something that you're saying is when you speak up is you are also dense demonstrating carriage. And I think that that's so important to, ag to acknowledge and to recognize that, you know, a lot of what I also think we, part of our work is, is to cultivate carriage. And I just want to say that, that, that Thank you. you I, I have really found um, carriage when you speak, speak up and when you acknowledge these really hard feelings and topics that takes carriage. And that's a lot of the work of life. Uh, yes, it, it does. I think um, my modern analytic training helped me with that because it normalized that being criticized is uh, therapeutic and, and reparative for people. Yeah. I'm not talking about the people who want to repetitively point out your uh, faults and seem to get some sort of sadistic pleasure. That's not progressive. We're talking about people who are speaking to what's going on, who are um, interested in learning how to put their angry feelings into words and who are, who are finally feeling that their voice can um, be allowed instead of quietly um, suppressed. Um, one of the things that I only mentioned briefly, and I saw it in the chat, is I have been studying a lot more the, the gratification I get from the power that I have as a group leader. That when I started doing groups, it, I was working with uh, heart patients, and uh, 
Uh, nobody told me that uh, cardiac patients don't want to pay attention to their feelings, and they certainly do not want to be in groups. So how uh, my analyst convinced me to do groups with cardiac patients, and I didn't think that was crazy, uh, was probably just positive transference, and he also wanted to help me. But um, a, a lot of the, the work that I've been doing around um, racial literacy and implicit bias has made me think of the ways in which I really like my power. And as a white uh, person and now of a senior generation, that I like it and that that can be a very dangerous thing. So the combination for me of learning that um, my errors not only humanize me, but enable my the people who work with me to feel more compassionate towards themselves. And then realizing that my, my denial of my white supremacy could be played out in group even more powerfully than in, in some ways in one-on-one -on -one really has. And then the process of seeing how my speaking to that to my uh, groups with um, BIPOC members has been just tremendously important, has made me feel that um, my finding the courage is the least of what I need to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that your group members need to find the courage. Yes. So it's interesting now, when I wrote this, um, okay. the first scenario, I, I was reacquainted with something that I had sort of taken for granted because we say very blithely, put your thoughts and feelings into words, right? As if uh, speaking out loud things is not a dangerous thing. So when I sat and, and thought, am I really going to admit that I worry about my income when there are a lot of groups that are missed? It seemed like every, every snowstorm was on that group. And for some reason, I was uh, really focusing on my accountant father's penny counting. Was I gonna really speak to that in, in public? Well, if I wasn't gonna speak to it, Judy was gonna speak to it. So the combination of her counting uh, the money she was sending me and my thinking about it, I thought, all right, I'm gonna think about it. So how many times is money not brought up in, in polite circumstances? I don't know those of you who know, money is discussed less often than sex. And so bringing the taboo topic in really, and, and sitting there and having the, am I gonna say that? Am I not gonna say that? Really reminded me that uh, consciously or unconsciously, every person who works with me has to go to that emotional edge. And my forgetting that does not do them any favors. It gives me a false sense of security and power and superiority that, that does not lead me to remain connected with their humanity. And so I, I found the times when I have to have my own reckoning really very, um, uh, it's a mixture of humbling and humiliating, sort of two words that depends on how, judge, how judgmental you are. When I'm judgmental, I feel like it's humiliating that, that I had to spend so much time to like get to this point. And then when I say it, I feel humble and grateful that um, I have people who are gonna listen to it and talk with me about it. That's a real gift. We take it for granted. When people can't talk to us, well, why can't you talk? I'm listening. Well, I'm sorry. We're, we've arrived and the patients could be, you know, so far away from feeling safe that if we forget that, we're really not in touch with what our job really is about. There are no more questions up on the board right now. I, I just like to reiterate what you said because you're talking and it, it, it it struck a memory with me that one that's like never left me about uh, things that people will talk about and things that won't people talk about. And money is definitely one of them. Uh, uh, 
I think of somebody that I was working with, there was like a world renowned musician. He, ta he talked about, um, he was married, having sex with hookers, picking up drugs, doing it. And then I asked him the, the, the worst question imaginable. How much money do you have in the bank? <laughs> he said, how could you ask me such a question? He said, that's so personal. That, that only, that's the only thing that I should not be saying to you. Everything else, but money, no, that's very personal. There are a couple questions. Um, Jim, there was one from asking, can you read it? I think it was from Nikki. You're muted, Jim. Mayor Copa. Uh, Nikki, can you speak to reconciling the responsibility of the analyst to go first? It's, and it has race, money, power, and so forth, and the practice of following the patient. Um, this is something that I, I saw discussed. Um, those of you who are a part of AGPA, everybody who did a presentation at AGPA had to watch a, um, a, a conversation between Elliot Zizel and uh, several other uh, significant contributors to the group. And they, uh, Elliot talked about following the patient's lead, which is something called contact function. I, I believe that um, particularly if I am... Uh, in a group where there are a large, larger or predominance of white identified people, that it is my responsibility to speak to issues of race, uh, ableism, sexism, uh, any type of, any of the multitude, it seems to be growing the way we can um, be hurtful and discriminate against each other, that it's my responsibility to, to speak to that. One, because it then removes me as a quiet and uh, potentially uh, dangerous critic, because I am, I am outing myself as a privileged person. I'm privileged, we are all privileged to be sitting here. I'm sitting in a home that is safe and secure. I had dinner, I have loved ones who are not in danger. And that um, in doing that as a white identified person, I am removing the, uh, the potential dangerous speaking out of the BIPOC members of my group. That um, I, and I'm, I, if I'm going to be attacked by other white identified people, that's totally different than the, uh, the risk that a BIPOC member takes to speak about all these things. And if I'm going to acknowledge my, my uh, do I think of, Sorry, I'm reading from Nikki. Do I think about my responsibility differently in individual therapy? That's a very interesting question. Nikki, do you want to uh, say more about where that question came from for you? Hi. Um, hi, Nikki. Hi. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful of where that question came from. I've just been thinking about this because there was a speaker um, at one of the earlier lectures talking about race and how it's the responsibility of the analyst to, you know, early on bring that in. And I've heard that before. And with you talking about, you know, these issues, because I always have this idea of like the contact function and like if something's not in the client's mind, why am I going to put it in their mind? You know, like my point is to let them bring what they're, you know, thinking about. So I just am not sure how to like reconcile that and when I should be really bringing something to the table and when I should let it sit and wait for it to come from them. Well, this is a tricky um, question because there's really a call to action that has been um, sounded over the last couple of years. Let's, let's say it's been sounded for the many, many hundreds of years that privileged people have, have chosen to ignore. And so the question of, of speaking to that, for some people that's, uh, that is not seen as a therapeutic action, that, that's seen as a political or a societal, societal um, action. And I, I really think that as people who are looking to, who, how do I say this? I don't even know how to say this in a politically correct way. 
people who are sensitive to the oppression and violence that occurs between human beings to not do a personal inventory, to ask when there's a microaggression that's said, to not say it is a, in a microaggression in and of itself. It is a microaggression to every oppressed person that you will then encounter for whom you have not brought up, even in a gentle way, um, a racist comment or a prejudiced comment or some sort of um, stereotype that's being said. Now, how you say that is really um, a very a difficult thing to decide because when you say this, uh, you, are, are, you are changing the transference, okay? Some people would say enough of this white uh, identified people supporting white identified people, enough feeling comfortable because you have an attunement with another person. Our attunement with other people is at the cost of the, the misattunement and the exile of you know, millions of people who are not like us. Okay, so you have to ask myself, am I not going to speak out about this because I might lose my place as a member of the dominant class by um, saying something that I could get attacked for by other white identified people or other um, more conservative people? And, and I think that's a question that people who have privilege really need to think about that um, what, what is our holding on to our privilege doing to continue the oppression of people who don't have privilege? And a lot of times um, just thinking about, about privilege is an easier concept than thinking about oppression or racism. And I think this whole question of what's brought up in individual is exactly one of the places where we as as analysts, we have to think about um, whether there's something self-serving in our excusing ourselves, giving ourselves a pass, whether it's theoretical or it's personal, to not really do an inventory about how our, our approach to therapy could be maintaining oppressive uh, systems. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was really helpful and I appreciate your insight. You're welcome. It's very, I, I believe that what I've said in some analytic circles is really very controversial. And um, that I understand that and it also makes me sad. So this is where getting comfortable with the divisions within our groups, the, the ways in which it's going to be hard for us to change some of our theories and um, it means getting comfortable with discomfort that in some ways is uh, more challenging than negative transference. Julia um, Stein asked whether there was any place it was written about the valuing self. Um, I haven't seen it, Julia. I, I made up the idea after I read Larry Epstein. Um, so I, I, wanted, I liked crediting Dr. Epstein because he was a brilliant and a wonderful analyst and trainer of many wonder, wonderful analysts. But I, um, I, at some point, one of my trainees is going to say I have to write a paper. So I guess I'll have to research it and find out um, uh, what wonderful valued person already said it. And then I'll just ask him if I can share in the riches and I'll let you know. Now, uh, Brian, you've uh, already raised your hand and I'm wondering if there's somebody who could use a little bit of your courage to urge themselves to say something before we finish tonight. I've been Some reading my group members are here and, I and I'm trying to inhibit myself from uh, asserting my personal pleasure and power by asking them to talk. So I'll just say it's very nice to see you all.
I hope if there are things that occur to you <clears throat> that you wanted to say that this forum is not conducive to say that you would choose to email that to me. I realize that this topic, um, <clears throat> I was ahead of the game because I've had in some of these cases a while to digest um, what I talked about. And I feel like I've given you um, a big meal, some of which probably is not so easily digestible. Um, so if things come up afterwards that you would like me to uh, respond to, please uh, email me. And um, I guess somebody who has access to the chat, yeah. I guess I can put my email in the, the chat. Ellen, thank you for that invitation and thank you for for being available to us and all the levels that you have been this evening. You're certainly a reminder um, of um, what are the most important psychoanalytic values, although we hardly ever live up to it, has always been honesty. And um, mm -hmm. you really have uh, been honest in ways that are um, very vulnerable and difficult uh, things to talk about and we don't talk about. <clears throat> so that may be some of the hesitancy. Uh, but um, I want to thank you on behalf of our board and um, our uh, faculty and students and want to thank all of you who've attended tonight for your participation and for uh, being with us and hope you'll join us again. And uh, in the meantime, keep alive, try to be well, try to be um, keep awake and be yourselves and behave yourselves the best you can. <laughs> thank you, Wally. Thank you. And um, thank you, everybody who's attached to the school for keeping the school going. <laughs> I really believe that a lot of what I talked about today, I could only do because of the feelings that my modern analytic analysts and uh, supervisors and colleagues helped me be able to tolerate. So this was really a lovely gift to me and a way I could give back and say thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good Thank night. you for that, Alan. <clears throat> I will stay around for a couple minutes if there are people who uh, feel that talking in a smaller and less public forum would be more conducive in case uh, that that's uh, I'm happy to offer that as an option. Good night. Good night. Thank you. I'll hang around.